Of course, there's a tremendous cold that Gregor feels being in this water. Eventually, he jumps out of the water, and he, together with Axenia, the wife of a neighbor, a neighbor to Gregor's family, and uh, Gregor already obviously has eyes for Axenia, in order to warm themselves, they jump into a haystack together. Gregor's enamored of the lady, and other things might well happen, but uh, suddenly the arrival of his father makes him jump out with his body steaming partly from the Don water and partly from other causes. Gregor's father is terribly worried about his son's attraction, knowing full well the trouble and disorder such an affair can bring into the small and well-knit fabric of the Cossack village. Aksinya has been married to Stepan Astachov, who treats her uh, with terrible cruelty in the traditional Cossack way, all the more so because it turns out that she was not a virgin uh, uh, when, when he was married. What had happened was, as a very young woman, she had been raped by her own father in a, in a drunken orgy. You get some notion of the primitive and terrible quality of certain aspects of Cossack life in this story. So that Tsipan Nastakhov, in his disappointment, tends to beat her and beat her in, in terrible places in the body. There's some, t there's some awfully cruel uh, parts of this novel, and he makes it feel very strongly. Well, Gregor's father is determined to put an end once and for all to this blasted affair, which can get him in all kinds of trouble, not only with his neighbor, but with the total Cossack village. After all, things have been in, in as I said before, things have been stable for a long, long time. This kind of thing is uh, only guaranteed to upset any kind of stability that would occur in the uh, village. So he, go, through a marriage broker, broker, he goes to a, uh, another Cossack family by the name of Karshunov and finds a young woman, Natalia Karshunova, uh, whom he he decides he will marry his son Gregor to Natalia Karshunova, and Gregor is still enough of a member of the Cossack tradition that he realizes he has to do what his father says. So what we have is a description of a traditional Slavic wedding, a traditional Slavic Cossack wedding is described in delightful and colorful detail. Sholokhov obviously has a tremendous attraction to the society, and the, the colorful nature of the wedding is something that is enormously attractive to the reader. But Gregor is determined that uh, although he may well be married to Natalia, he's not going to uh, stick to her the way a good Cossack should. He's going to continue the affair with Aksinia, and of course this continues to cause a tremendous amount of trouble in the Cossack village. Gregor is, after all, now a married man. This is something that just isn't done in the Cossack society. In showing us the uh, colorful nature of the Cossack society that Gregor is about to abandon, Sholkov shows us another aspect of the Cossacks, which is probably the most attractive aspect of the entire Cossack culture, namely the Cossack music. The traditional Cossack basses, the traditional Cossack tenors, sing in a way that is, uh, has a very, very special quality and has a kind of depth of feeling that you rarely feel among singers, even among very, very good professional singers. And there's a uh, traditional song that they often sang that uh, is based on an old uh, military metaphor about a warrior who goes to a battle as if it were a wedding, and of course the bride whom he's espousing is death. It goes something like this. Чёрный ворон, чёрный ворон, что ж ты, что ж ты вьёшься надо мной? Ты добычи не дозёшься, чёрный ворон, я не твой. This dark raven, dark raven, don't don't circle over me. I'm not yours. Чёрный ворон, чёрный ворон, ты лети, лети ко мне домой. Передай моей невесте, что я женился на другой. Black raven, black raven, fly to my home. Tell my would-be bride that I've married another. Сабля востра была свахой, угощал, гощал каленый штык. А невеста пуля злая близко к сердцу прилегла. The sharp saber was the marriage broker. The wedding feast was done with a sharp bayonet. And the bride was an evil bullet, an evil bullet which lay close to my heart. Чёрный ворон, чёрный ворон, Что ж ты, что ж ты вьёшься надо мной? Ты добычи не дождёшься, Чёрный ворон, я не твой. And of course, in this song, you feel the rhythm and the power of the Cossack tradition. Well, uh, Gregor 
obviously is not going to be able to continue this kind of, uh, uh, you might say, two wives situation, he decides that the only thing he can do is to run off to work for wages on the estate of the aristocratic Lisnitsky family that lives near the Cossack village, thereby becoming reduced to the status of a hired worker, a class enormously despised by the Cossacks who value their independence as fighters and farmers on their own plots of land. Uh, you see that uh, step by step, the divisions are taking place, which is really going to split up this Cossack village in a way that will be entirely uh, a constant with the revolutionary reality that's coming. The village still feels reverberations from the changes that are becoming more intense in the larger Russian society of the early 20th century. There's a tremendous amount of political agitation going on, and the various parties, especially those on the left, are looking for support in the population. It might seem unlikely that the Cossacks with their privileged position would be attracted to programs of reform and change, but the radical parties don't overlook any possibility for gaining support. So here is Gregor off working on the estate of the aristocratic Lisnitsky family, working for wages, something a Cossack should never do. And one day in the village, a stranger suddenly appears. He has a name that's quite different from any kind of Slavic or Cossack name. His name is Osip Stockmann. Of course, Stockmann is clearly a man of German origin, although his family had obviously lived in Russia for many generations. He asks his Cossack driver many detailed questions about life in the village and says he's come to set up a locksmith shop in the village. He was formerly a factory worker in Rostov, the major city in the Cossack region. It becomes immediately clear that he's a member of the revolutionary party who's been sent to the village to see what he can do, to see what he can do to garner support. And no sooner does he set up shop than he invites many of the poorer Cossacks to his house for tea and card playing, and that quickly turns into reading and lectures about the historical origins of the Cossack community. And the Cossacks are enormously surprised to learn that, as a matter of fact, they themselves are descendants of serfs. Of course, they didn't know this because their own tradition was that they were free people owning the land. In the beginning, they resent the statement because it seems to make them part of the peasantry whom they hold in great contempt. But the accurate historical knowledge does begin to seep in, and this too is another part of that wedge which is separating the society. And you have a scene shortly after his arrival where both the Cossacks and Ukrainian peasants who live in villages not far from there have brought their wheat to the same mill for processing, for grinding in the mill. And an argument erupts about their places in line waiting for service. The argument leads to nasty words, nasty words lead to blows, and soon there's a threat of a real physical uh, violent fight between them. And in the midst of this fight, suddenly one of them says, look, let's burn down the mill. And they even, get, they even set some material burning which they want to throw onto the mill. Of course, the burning of the mill would be a terrible thing for all of them. And suddenly, a man whom none of them have previously seen in a black hat suddenly steps into the breach, and lo and behold, it's Stockmann. And of course, with a smile on his face, with impressive gestures, he addresses the Cossacks as countrymen. He calls them fellow Russians. Of course, they say, look, we're not Russians, we're Cossacks. And people descended from the same class and stock as the Ukrainian peasants. The Cossacks are shocked by this, because of course, they look down on the peasants. They think the peasants are completely separate from themselves. But Meanwhile, in the course of the shock, in the course of their reaction to it, they forget the fight, the moment of peak stress has passed, and serious mob violence has been avoided. What could have been a terrible, bloody fight between the Ukrainians and the Cossacks and the burning down of a mill turns into a peaceful scene. And of course, the novel is obviously making clear that leftist radicals had a program that stressed ideology over nationality. The Tsar had wanted to unite the empire with the idea of nationality, but as far as the the Bolsheviks were concerned, nationality didn't count, it was ideology that counted. Well, of course, when the police get wind of what's happened, they call in the Stockmann for questioning, and it turns out that previously in Rostov he'd been in prison for inciting disorders. At first they think he's a Jew, but they soon realize he's not Jewish. You notice how they immediately assume that anybody who did this would be Jewish. And the police tell him, look, get out of the district. They have no use for a person who stops violence between nationalities and tells the truth about history. This is not good for the Tsarist regime. And near the end of the first part of the novel, Stockman is arrested and deported under police guard. And the local people are amazed to see somebody who actually has the nerve to challenge the authority and the power of the Tsar himself. This makes the reader understand that there are large forces in motion which are going to make terrible rents in the fabric of a village which has been so well and organically integrated over so many previous generations. Finally, of course, the major step in the actual destruction of the village comes with the onset of World War I, 
with Russian forces fighting against the armies of Germany and Austria-Hungary. These countries are industrially and technologically far in advance of agri agrarian Russia. The Cossacks, of course, know nothing about this. They expect that this military campaign is going to be parallel to all of the campaigns they fought in the late 19th and uh, even early 20th century. They have no idea that this is going to be a much more mechanized war. It's going to turn out very differently from what they expected. And near the outset of the war, we see the Cossacks called up for the usual terms of military training. Even Gregor, who now lives and works outside the Cossack village on the Lisnitsky estate, nevertheless has to report to the army training camp, bringing equipment and a horse from home. And he's together with the young Cossacks from the village. The picture we get of the officers is one of a very different class from that of the Cossacks. Lisnitsky, the son of the man who owns the estate where Gregor works, is one of these officers. When Gregor shows his equipment to the officer for inspection, his hairy black hand accidentally touches the officer's white hand. The officer snatches his hand away as if it had been burned, as if some violence had taken place, and hastily puts on his glove. Clearly, the tie between the officers and the Cossacks is beginning to get weaker. And Gregor exhibits characteristics that in some important ways differ enormously from the traits of people around him. As I said before, he's capable of enormous crudeness and even cruelty to the women around him. Particularly when you think of what he did to his wife, uh, who was terribly disappointed, of course, in his having left her. She was after all a loyal and a faithful wife, somebody who had done everything that a Cossack wife should do, and yet he abandoned her. And when he asked her how she was to live, he very crudely sent her and said, look, live by yourself and don't bother me. Uh, there's something not very admirable about this kind of an attitude. And yet, uh, there are two incidents that make us realize that Gregor is somewhat different from the ordinary Cossack. Perhaps it's his Turkish blood. Perhaps it's simply his own character. But uh, while he's reaping in the field, uh, working with a scythe, his scythe accidentally hits a duck who's been concealed in the tall grass. He instinctively picks up the wounded animal and tries to warm it with his body. This is something an ordinary Cossack would never have taken the trouble to do. In the training camp, we see another one of the awful scenes that uh, take place in this novel. There's a young woman, Franya, whom the men see, and of course the men are away from home and away from women, and they're, they're, uh, their sexual uh, yearnings have, have no outlet. And suddenly they decide that they're going to get hold of Franya and have their sexual pleasure from her. And so they grab her, they set her down in a barn for their own pleasure, and what we see is a scene of mass rape, a gang rape of Franya. The only Cossack who refrains from this awful business is Gregor. And not only does he refrain, but he actually tries to stop his fellow Cossacks in an attempt to prevent the rape. This would have been something absolutely unheard of, I think, in Cossack society at that time. He has the moral power to go against his fellow Cossacks, his, fellow, his friends, and the people who are close to him in order to stop, to stop them from doing something that clearly is horrible. They overpower him, of course. They stop him. They, they put a bag over his head and warn him to, to stay away or, he, or he'll regret it. But it's clear that he has a very different conscience from theirs. This means that through his eyes, we're going to be looking at coming portentous events quite differently from the way the usual Cossacks would see them. The coming violence of World War I and its revolutionary aftermath will consume the Cossack world with fire and almost total destruction. And yet, in many ways, both large and small, Gregor is going to maintain an unusual sense of humanity and balance, which we're going to be seeing in the next lecture, which will deal with other parts of this novel.